Welcome everyone. Today we'll be talking about the topic of locomotion, which essentially deals with how different mobile robotic systems move in their environment. And so there are different examples of mobile robotic systems. These could be small robots which move in indoor environments. These could be autonomous cars which move in the urban cities. Or these could be, for example, flying drones, uh, which have propellers and let them fly. Or these could be some other complex movement systems, such as for humanoids, which have legged systems. In each of these cases, uh, we provide certain input to these mobile robotic systems. So this could be movement of motors, movement of the legs, movement of the propellers, whatever. And this results in a certain movement for that uh, mobile robotic system in its environment. So to understand how these inputs link to the movement, is what basically locomotion does. So in this lecture, we will primarily focus uh, our attention to uh, mobile systems that are wheeled. So uh, they are equipped with wheels, which let them move around in their environment. A couple of reasons to do this. One, they're one of the most common uh, kind of platforms that are available in our, uh, around us, and, uh, uh, and therefore very useful to know how they work. And two, because the analysis is quite straightforward, which lets us understand the principles in a rather simple manner. So let's get started. Uh, what does locomotion really mean? So the definition is, to, uh, is the power of motion from place to place. Essentially, what, what locomotion deals with is to understand how to move from point A to point B in your environment. And this is done quite at a lower level in the sense that we don't really understand at this point how our environment looks like or anything. We don't have a map of the environment or we don't have a plan which we want to particularly follow. It's more at a level as to understand when we provide certain inputs to our mobile robotic system, how does it respond? How does it actually move in its, uh, move in its environment? Right. And this information is actually relevant for state estimation problems. So if we understand how the, mobile, uh, how the robot reacts to certain input commands, then we kind of have an estimate of where the robot is over a period of time. This information, so this locomotion information, can then be fused with information coming from other sensors, some other external sensors. This could be, say, a GPS sensor if you're outside or this could be a laser scanner, which gives us some motion of how we moved. And so these, uh, this information can then be fused together in order to estimate the pose of our system. So these are some techniques that we'll see in other parts of the course, but basically the idea of locomotion fits in there in order to have an estimate of how the platform has moved. So, uh, in this lecture, since we limit ourselves to wheeled robots, there are three or four types of wheeled robots which are quite common, and they are listed here. They're also called as drives. So we'll spend quite a bit of time understanding uh, what is called as the differential drive. Essentially, these are, are robots, typically indoor robots, which have a couple of wheels on them, and each of these wheels has a motor attached to them, which rotates these motors, uh, and lets them move around in their environment. We'll, uh, we'll see in detail how, uh, how the motion is evolved and how we can control such, uh, such robots. The other common kind of robot or drive that we have all seen is the Ackermann drive or the car drive. Essentially, in these vehicles, you have the back wheels which are fixed, and we have front wheels which can be then steered. And in this way, we are able to track a certain path or a certain uh, circular arc, for example. Then there are these two other drives which are quite interesting. One is called as the synchronous drive and another which is based on these mechanum wheels, uh, which, are qu which become quite interesting in uh, confined spaces. So if you have really limited space to make our maneuver, uh, these kind of drives really help us out there. So we'll also look uh, a little bit about how and where these drives can be useful. Okay, so the basis of a wheeled robot is a wheel. So we start at the wheel and the concept is something we're all familiar with. So we have a wheel and there is an axis going through the wheel. 
typically this, uh, this axis or this axle is then connected to a motor which rotates. And for example here, if the motor rotates in the clockwise direction, we end up with a motion which is uh, in the forward direction. So this is a very simple case in 1D, nothing surprising there. However, uh, if we have multiple wheels, the analysis is not so straightforward. So we want to understand what happens when we stack several of those wheels on a mobile platform. And we want to understand what's the resulting motion when we apply different, for example, inputs, different velocities on each of these wheels, how do they then react? Right, so let's uh, see how this works. And to understand basically this motion, there's this concept of instantaneous uh, center of curvature. Essentially what this means is that uh, if we make our whole robotic system move around a certain uh, center of curvature, then we can ensure that the wheels that are attached to this system move smoothly. So basically they roll. When they roll, they move smoothly on the, on the surface instead of skidding around. So what we really want to avoid is that the platforms skid around in the environment as then there will be large forces both on the, on the floor itself where the robot is moving, but also large uh, forces that are acting on the platform itself. So the idea is to have the wheels always rolling. And one of the ways to actually ensure this rolling is to make sure that all the axes of the wheels are intersecting at a common point. So this is not good. Why? Because for example, if say these are three uh, wheels that are on our platform, and there's this axis which passes through the, each of these wheels. And since each one of these wheels is rotating, they do not have a common center. And therefore what will happen is one or more of these wheels will be skidding. Instead, if we arrange them in the following uh, manner, such that the axes which pass through each of these wheels pass through an instantaneous center of uh, curvature, then they can all move smoothly as one object around that ICC. So there are two ways to look at it. Either we can see them as uh, multiple wheels on the same platform, or we could see it as the, uh, as the platform at different points of time. And in either case, we would want them to move in such a manner that there is always one point around which it's moving along a curve, right? And uh, what we want to do, what we want to essentially set is we want to control these different wheels. So by spinning them at different rates or by steering them in a particular manner, such that uh, we always maintain this one point of rotation. Right, so in order to do this, let's start off with the basic laws of physics, which we will use. Uh, to, to derive these equations and to understand how the platform moves uh, while following a particular arc, for example. So, uh, for example, the first law here is, is a very basic one, which says the amount of distance moved s is nothing but the linear velocity of the platform multiplied by the amount of time for which that particular command has been given. So this is a really simple model in the sense that we are also neglecting any accelerations here. So there are no acceleration terms. Essentially this, uh, this means that we are making the assumption that uh, we can supply a particular velocity to the platform instantaneously. This is typically not the case in real robots. You often require a certain time in order to reach a desired velocity. But it so happens that for controlling robots or for understanding the motion of robots at lower speeds, this is a fair enough assumption. And the next equation that we see here is the angular orientation of our platform. So the yaw angle in this case, represented by theta, is nothing but the angular velocity of the, uh, of the robot, omega multiplied by the time for which that particular angular velocity has been applied. And similarly, uh, we also have a relationship between the linear velocity and the angular velocity when a particular uh, platform or any point mass for that matter 
is following a circular arc. So in this case, uh, the relationship between the linear velocity is nothing but the angular velocity times the radius of curvature of the arc which that particular platform is following. So uh, these equations will be used in order to understand how different drives or different robots actually move in their environments. We start off with the most basic or the most common drive, what is also called as differential drive that you see here. So essentially a differential drive robot has two wheels. So one we see on this side and one on the back side, which we don't see here. But and um, basically each of these wheels is connected to an axle, uh, connected then to a motor which rotates. So what we can do is to move each of these two wheels independently. We can see this a little bit better in this uh, picture here. It's a smaller robot, but the idea is the same. There's also a differential drive robot. Uh, again, two wheels connected to two individual robots, which can spin at different velocities if we wanted to. And uh, often times what is often kept is also a third wheel, which is a free moving wheel, also called as a caster wheel. So it's mainly to maintain a balance and is not an active wheel, so to say. Okay, so what, what we can do here is to set the velocities of each of these uh, uh, tires or the wheels independently. And for example, let's say we want to go straight with this particular robot. The answer is quite simple. We set the same velocities both on, let's say the left wheel and the right wheel, and this would result in the platform moving in a straightforward manner. The same if you want to move back, just the velocities are reversed and in this way we can move back. However, if we want to move along a curve, this changes slightly. So if you think of it, if you want to make a curve like this, uh, the wheel which is on the left, which is actually also in this case an inner wheel, it's towards the curve, has to travel a distance which is less than the distance that the outer wheel has to travel. And so since the outer wheel has to travel a larger distance when it's following this particular arc, it needs to spin faster such that overall they don't uh, skid. And, and also if you think in terms of the instantaneous center of curvature that we just introduced, by construction these differential drive robots always have an instantaneous center of curvature. For example, since these axes pass through both these uh, uh, wheels, essentially the instantaneous center of curvature will lie on that uh, axis. What's also interesting is that these kind of robots can also spin on spot, which is really interesting to have if we have confined spaces. You can imagine that this is not possible for a car or a car-like robot, what's also we saw called an Ackerman robot because there you can't really rotate on spot. There's a minimum turning circle that's there which restricts us from making arbitrarily sharp turns, so to say. However, for differential robots, this is quite a nice property. So how this is done is that by rotating the uh, one of the wheels, so let's say the left wheel in say clockwise direction and the other one in anti-clockwise direction, we are able to spin on spot. And by switching it, we can spin on the other way as well. And so these are quite interesting properties for a differential robot. Uh, let's now uh, put some variables uh, on this robot to understand what are the different terms that we are interested in and so on. So like we said, so we have two velocities, the left and the right. So these are the velocities that can be set as an input to the system. So VL and VR here. And then there is an uh, angular velocity that, uh, that, uh, that exists along, let's say, the center of mass of this robot. And then there's also the width of these uh, robot. We will see why these particular terms are important in order to uh, describe the motion that, that such drives actually follow. Uh, in addition to its x, y, for example, position here, defined by its center of mass, we are also interested in the orientation of the robot here given by theta. So uh, to describe the position of our robot, of this differential robot in a, in a global coordinate frame, what we would require essentially is the x 
and the y positions of the center of mass and often this is taken on the uh, or at the midpoint of the axis that passes through these wheels so somewhere here and we're also interested in the orientation of the rubber okay so let's see a little bit in more detail again it's the same thing what we saw before we have a, a, a left velocity and the right velocity for the two corresponding wheels we have an orientation of the robot and what we also show here is the uh, is the radius uh, to the instantaneous center of curvature here so this point here represents this instantaneous center of curvature so the robot is making a turn presumably like this along this point and of course we have the length of the uh, or length between the two wheels on the robot itself so now we will use one of the laws that we saw before which is the relationship between the linear and the angular velocities of the robot so essentially what we would like to end up with is to understand the motion of the robot in terms of its linear and angular velocity so v and omega in terms of the commands or in terms of the velocities that are set to it right? so for example in this case vl and vr are the velocities that are set to these two wheels and what we want to understand is how does the overall robot the overall platform respond to these commands so we want to understand what the angular velocity as well as the linear velocity of the platform as a whole is given that we set vl and vr to the two wheels and so we'll develop some equations and come out with these results and see how they look like and where we start with is the relationship between the linear and angular velocities so essentially the formula that we are following is v is equals to omega times r where r is the radius of the circle that it's going along so in this case if we take at the left uh, wheel here the uh, radius uh, along uh, or the radius of the circle that it's 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 following uh, in this case it's the distance to the instantaneous center of curvature is nothing but r minus l over 2 so since r is the distance from the center of the robot to the instantaneous center of curvature and l over 2 is this distance essentially this particular distance that's left here is nothing but r minus l over 2 and the same happens for the right wheel here so nothing Uh, nothing more but it's uh, r plus l over 2 since it's on the other side right so we just rewrite these two equations here and the first step is to uh, is to just take out omega on one side so what we have is are uh, these equations with vr over r plus l by 2 being equal to vl over r minus l by 2 then we do some algebra very simple algebra just multiply and move the terms around what we would find is we multiply vr times r uh, minus l over 2 is nothing but vl times r plus l over 2 then we can remove some terms and then if we rearrange it what we would like to find is an expression for the r so the uh, so the radius of the uh, so the distance between the uh, the center of the wheels to the Uh, to the instantaneous center of curvature so this radius of the circle that the platform itself is following around and if we move these equations so we take r out and if we move the equations around what we will end up is with a, is an equation for r which depends on two things or three things which depends on the l which is the distance between the two wheels so l is nothing but the distance between these two wheels and it depends on the left and the right wheel velocity so now we have an expression for r based on our inputs as well as some dimensions of the robot itself right uh let's see what else can be developed from here so we have these equations which we saw uh before we can also uh add them up so in this case we basically add these two velocities here and we obtain the equation here so nothing vl plus vr is omega times r minus l over 2 plus r plus l over 2 and these two terms will cancel each other out there and if uh, giving us vl plus vr or vr plus vl equals to 2 omega r 
and therefore if you rearrange we have an expression for the angular velocity of the whole platform in terms of the uh, individual velocities of the wheels and the radius of curvature. Since we had just computed the radius of curvature, uh, we replace it into this equation and we will end up with an equation like this which where, where we will have basically these terms sitting in here. And if you look at this equation, we can see that we can uh, cross over some terms and with a little bit of manipulation what you end up is now again uh, equation for the omega so which is the angular velocity of the platform in terms of either the velocities that have been set to individual wheels or some parameter of the robot itself so in this case the length between the two wheels that we have so we have we have done two things one we have expressed uh, the the radius of the curve or the radius of yeah the curvature for uh, the, yeah the curvature uh, which the robot is going to follow in terms of these parameters. We have also expressed uh, the angular velocity in terms of the two velocities of left and right uh, wheels, uh, uh, yeah, as we see here. What we can then do is also find out an expression for the linear velocity by replacing these two things that we had computed in step two and step three. So step I think gave us the angular velocity as a vr minus vl by l and r was nothing but l over 2 times the right velocity plus the left one whole divided by the right velocity minus the left one and if we just replace these true two uh, uh, equations here what we would end up is that the linear velocity is this expression here and here we see that these two terms are the same which we can cross out, the L's cross out. Essentially what we end up is that the linear velocity is nothing but the average of the left and the right velocity and this also makes sense intuitively. And so what we have now are three things. One, we know what the, uh, how the, the complete platform moves uh, with respect to the left and the right velocities that we put onto these two wheels. We know what's the angular velocity of the robot is and we also know the radius of the curve that, the, the, that this robot travels along. So these are the important terms that we require in order to understand how this differential robot moves when a particular velocity is applied to the left and the right wheels. So with this, we can also compute the coordinates, for example, of the instantaneous center of curvature. Right, so we've had the, uh, the radius, which is given by this particular term here. And then uh, we know that if the position of the robot is set here to X and Y, and then some amount of trigonometry, so uh, it, it makes an angle of theta with the positive X axis. So essentially this particular uh, coordinate would be nothing but the position of this which is x minus the r times of sinus of that theta would give us this particular coordinate and similarly to get the y coordinate it would be a uh, cosine of theta which needs to be added to the position of that uh, of that point itself so what we are now able to express is the coordinates of the uh, instantaneous center of curvature in a global coordinate frame using the radius of curvature that we just computed now. Next what we are really interested is to infer how the platform is going to move. So for example we know where the platform is at time t and we want to understand where the platform would be at time t plus 1 and this is also called as forward kinematics. So given the velocities, whatever VL and VR to the two, uh, two wheels, where would we end up after one particular time step? So what we see here is a, let's say a discrete uh, format of understanding this. So for example, for a time period of delta T, we put our, or we, um, we apply a constant velocity to our platform. So a constant uh, rotational and uh, linear velocity to the platform. 
the new position. So in this case, x refers to the, the position, so the location x and y, whereas theta refers to the orientation of the robot. And essentially, this depends on the uh, uh, on on where it is. So what you need to do is to is to take where you are. So this is x t, and subtract the coordinates of where your uh, instantaneous center of rotation is. So this gives us x t minus x i c c, and then when we multiply it with the rotation matrix, so this r of omega t corresponds to the rotation matrix, which is defined along an axis which is perpendicular to the plane here. Uh, this way, we uh, we would get the uh, the new uh, position of the robot. So we have to take the x i c c and add it to this uh, difference vector that we have just computed. Similarly, we can also compute the new orientation as nothing but the old orientation plus the angular velocity times delta t because this is the amount that the ro uh, that the robot has rotated in the meanwhile. So this is a way to understand how the robot would uh, move over time. And in this case, it's a discrete uh, formulation, whereas here it's the same idea, but as a continuous formulation. So this is what actually happens in reality, right? So you don't have constant velocities per se, but rather following a trajectory or a profile of velocities. And there we would end up integrating instead of just adding like we saw here. Okay, so the next rubber that we actually see here is quite similar to the differential rubber that we saw before in the sense that these uh, wheels, both in the front and the back, are attached with a fixed axle. You can control the, uh, the velocities of, let's say, the front wheels and the back wheels separately, but they are attached uh, rigidly. So in some sense, it's similar to differential drive but if we look carefully, there's a flaw, so to say, in the kinematic design of this robot itself. Because if you think there's an axis which is going through the front, uh, a front uh, pair of uh, wheels, and there's also an axis which is going through the back pair of wheels. And since they're attached rigidly parallel to each other, there is no way that those two uh, 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 axes will ever meet. So of course, if you just want to move straight, it's fine. They're parallel, you apply the same velocities to all the wheels and, that, and then you go straight, either forward or backward. However, as soon as we have to make any uh, turn, then this means that since these two axes can never intersect, this kind of robot will always skid. It's never possible to roll freely with this kind of robots. And therefore, sometimes these kind of control or to control these robots are also called as skid steer uh, robots. So they're not very elegant in terms of kinematics, but it so happens that they're quite sturdy and they're often used in outdoor environments for navigation. The next drive that we look at is what is called as the Ackerman drive. So this is the, the typical car. In this case, it's an autonomous car, but uh, just the car, yet the same. And uh, for these kind of cars, what you would have is that the back wheels would be usually fixed and the front wheels are, uh, are steerable. So in this case, essentially what would happen is if you want to go straight, of course, the same idea, put the same velocities on all the four wheels and then you go straight. But if you want to turn, the idea would be then to turn the wheels such that you obtain a uh, instantaneous center of curvature by intersecting the back wheel axis and the front one. Right, so uh, since this is an, uh, an Ackerman kind of drive, uh, the, the kind of maneuvers that it can do are restricted. For example, uh, like a differential drive, it can't really rotate on spot because at the least there is this distance or this difference between the back wheel and the front wheel and therefore it can't make a, a non-zero uh, uh, radius turn so to say. Right. So let's look at how this uh, Ackerman drive actually works. So to analyze this Ackerman drive one usually uh, approximates or it's an assumption that one makes instead of using the real back wheels you take a 
a virtual B which lies at the center of these axes and this point would then be so to say would be the center of mass or the center of the uh, vehicle which will follow the trajectory P here as shown here. And again we have these terms L which is the width between the two wheels as well as this term D which is the distance between the back wheel axis and the front wheel axis. So the goal would be to uh, figure out how to make this particular robot follow a particular trajectory shown here in blue here. Right, so uh, to make the analysis simple, one usually uh, approximates this Ackermann drive to what is called or Ackermann model to what is called as a bicycle model. So in addition to this virtual wheel in the back, we also create so to say a virtual wheel in the front. Sometimes this wheel is also called as the ideal wheel. However, the difference is that this wheel is fixed, whereas this uh, front wheel is steerable. So you could think of this wheel moving at different uh, steering angles in order to track a particular trajectory. <laughs> okay, so let's see how, uh, how this would then uh, result in a, a motion. So for example, now let's say we want to follow a particular arc, right? So a arc which is for uh, passing through this back wheel. However, if we put the same steering angle of our so-called ideal wheel on to the actual wheels that you see here, since there is some distance between these two front wheels, the circle along which that they are passing does not have the same radius anymore. This means then that they are slipping. So each one of these front wheels is actually following a different curve uh, instead of the one that we actually follow, which we want to follow using, these, uh, using this path P here. So if you think about it, the answer to this would be then that the two front wheels cannot just steer at the same angle they need to move or they need to be steered at different angles. So the one which is towards the inside of the curve needs to steer less, whereas the one which is on the outside probably needs to steer more. In either case, uh, we need to have different steering angles for the inside and the outside wheels. And actually this is what also happens when we actually steer our car uh, in real life. And so let's actually try to derive these uh, equations and see how that looks like. So first, let's do it for the ideal wheel itself. Although this wheel doesn't exist in reality, let's now for, 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 uh, for assumption's sake, assume that there's this ideal wheel and we want to figure out how much we should steer so that we have a instantaneous center of rotation and therefore we are rolling smoothly. So in this case, for example, we uh, determine or we uh, define this steering angle by delta. And if we look at the right angles, we would also uh, come out that this angle here is delta. So what we see here is again, uh, this is the center of the back wheel and this is the instantaneous center of curvature. So this R is basically this radius of that particular circle. We again have this D, which is the length between the two axis and the L which is the width of the uh, of the car itself. So the question that we now want to ask is what should be this delta such that it intersects uh, the, at our instantaneous center of rotation or what is the relationship between delta and other geometric quantities that we see here. And actually this is quite straightforward. So if you look at the tangent of this angle delta that is nothing but the opposite side here, which is D, which is the distance between the two axes, and the this particular distance here, which is nothing but R, uh, uh, yeah, it's R because it's the distance from the center of our car to the instantaneous center or location. So basically tan of delta is D over R, which means delta is nothing but arctan of D over R. <laughs> However, if we actually want a smooth motion for all the three, uh, or for the whole vehicle as a whole, then it means that we need different circles that the inner and the outer wheel actually follow. 
So this is the path that we want to track. And also the path that the, the back wheel tracks can be slightly different from the one that the ideal wheel or the center front wheel tracks. And so by, by choosing the, uh, the steering angles for the inner and the outer wheel such that they intersect at the same point as our ideal wheel does, then we could come out with a formulation or a way in order to track our robot along a curved surfaces without any slipping. So it, it will be smooth, so to say. And so the question is, how do we actually figure out what these steering angles for the two front wheels are? And so we go back to, uh, to the similar diagram like we had before, where if we uh, move our steering wheel by delta, so we could think uh, as this steering angle as as the amount of steering, for example, that we give on uh, uh, on the steering wheel. This this need not be directly the case that if you move your steering wheel five degrees, that the wheel also moves five degrees. But just for argument's sake, let's assume that when you move your steering wheel by delta degrees, also the uh, the steering wheel moves by delta degrees. So the question that we want to answer here is that if this ideal wheel moves by delta degrees, how much should the inner and the outer uh, wheel move by or how much they should rotate? And again, we get the constraints from the geometry of the platform itself. We want that the axis passing through these individual, uh, individual wheels all pass through the same point this ensures then that the whole overall system would rotate around the same point. This happens automatically for the wheels which are on the back side because they are attached to the same axis. The axis through them will also pass through the instantaneous center of curvature. What's more tricky is how to ensure that the front two wheels also pass through the instantaneous uh, uh, center of curvature. And like before, if we write down the formulation or the, or the relation, geometric relation here, we had this from before that the tan of delta is nothing but d over r. So this, uh, this v base length, so to say here, over the radius of curvature. Similarly, for the inner wheel, uh, delta i here, or the left wheel uh, that you see here, is nothing but the uh, d, which is the same. So this length is the same whereas the radius along which it's turning is shorter. So it's r, which is the distance from the center to the RCC, minus the uh, half of the length of this width of the car. And therefore we have the uh, relationship for the inner uh, tire or inner wheel as tan of delta di is d over r minus l by two. And similarly, we can argue for the outer wheel, this being tan of delta naught is uh, d over r plus l by 2. So now, if we set these angles delta i and delta o as given by these equations, we would ensure that the entire platform has one instantaneous center of curvature and therefore would uh, move smoothly along the curve that we want to track. And so, in principle, if you have a car for which we can make some digital calculations, we could think, okay, we could take, take the arctan of these numbers and then figure out, based on the curvature that we want to track, how much we should steer if it's an autonomous car. However, this problem is not something that's new. And uh, this has been done for quite a long time. For example, here what we see, the solution was also used is used in cars, but also was used originally for horse carriages. So what was happening was that uh, uh, previously, all the front wheels were steered in the same manner, which we now know is not good because this results in skidding, which results in large forces on these wheels. And this was what was happening. And this resulted in the fact that the, the carriages, the horse carriages were, were breaking down a lot. And there was a smart solution which was found in terms of a mechanical fix. So by attaching this uh, extra rod, they have to be calculated to be of a certain length. Also these linkages here have to be of a certain length, such that now when you pull or when you steer, you can move this mechanism here such that the axis that passes through the two front wheels will always rotate. This is also roughly how 
the mechanism in our cars or at least the older cars uh, work like. So this is a constraint that is made mechanically similar to so to say to enforce these uh, specific steering angles uh, but to do it rather in an elegant and a mechanical manner. And so now we know how essentially to control or to drive a Ackerman uh, uh, type of car by ensuring that the all the wheels all the four wheels, so to say, of the platform are rolling smoothly. With this, we move on to the next drive, which is an interesting drive also called as synchronous drive. So essentially what happens is that we, in the synchronous drive, you put wheels uh, parallel to each other on the platform, and then they all move at the same linear velocity. So if you give the same velocity to all those wheels, they would move straight. And similarly, by giving negative of that velocity, they move backwards. But what's interesting is that it's also possible to rotate all these wheels exactly the same. So there's one, let's say one motor which rotates certain at some angular velocity and that is transferred to each of these wheels. What this then results in a, is in a very kind of nice motion where you can move straight and back but also at a particular angle because all these wheels are attached at the, or all these wheels are rotated in the same way. So you could come out with really smooth motions and you could reach, you could reach parts of the environment in a confined space as opposed to using, for example, an Ackerman model where you would need to do more maneuvering in order to reach to the same positions in the, uh, in the environment. And again, similar to what we saw before, in order to understand what our new positions would be, we need to integrate our velocities over time and this will give us uh, the, uh, this will help us infer where the robot is at time t plus one. Another interesting robot is, uh, or a, a drive is uh, this XR4000, what was initially uh, done in XR4000. It's almost like an Ackerman drive in the sense that there are two uh, wheels on the front which can be steered, but also the wheels on the back can be steered. So in this sense, uh, what one does is to have the axis of these front and back wheels intersect at a particular ICC. Then we can ensure that the, uh, that the whole system rotates around the ICC. By moving both the front and the back uh, wheels, this allows to move in tighter circles than is what is possible with uh, Ackerman drive. So this really uh, uh, interesting kind of drive, which is uh, mainly used in the outdoor environments. And this is an example of uh, such a robot. Again, the, for the inference of the next uh, uh, time instance, so where the, the pose of the robot at the next time instance, we do the same. So we have to integrate the velocities over delta t's, which would give us the idea of where this robot would end up in at time t plus one. All right, so like I said, so we want to ensure that the ICC, so the axis passing through these four wheels, end up through or pass through this ICC, which would ensure a smooth motion. So this last mechanism that we see here is really one of the coolest ones. So this is uh, obtained using what are called as mechanum wheels. So essentially these are four uh, uh, motorized wheels with some passive rollers on top of it. So there are wheels on top of wheels. So these rollers are normally uh, put at an angle of 45 degrees on top of these actuated robots, uh, uh, actuated wheels. And by rotating these actuated wheels, these rollers then passively, so to say, rotate due to the normal forces and the friction from the ground. And what this allows is to do is to, uh, is to make movements, for example, a sideward movement, which would be not possible with a uh, Ackerman drive or even with a differential drive. So with these kind of robots, you're able to move, for example, side and so on. Uh, so for example, if you look at the uh, equations here, we have basically four motors. So there are four degrees of freedom and we can set the individual velocities on the X, on the Y and on the, the rotational velocity by uh, setting these different velocities on the four wheels. So by setting certain velocities for V0, V1, V2, V3, so the wheel 0, 1, 2, and 3, we can obtain a particular velocity in the x direction, similarly in the y direction, and an angular velocity. 
Uh, since we have four motors and only three degrees of freedom, we also have to ensure that this uh, er uh, error vector or this error velocity uh, goes to zero. So let's look at how this uh, motion or how this mechanism looks in practice. So this is a robot, for example, which has these mechanism wheels. And as you could see, it slides along the floor and reaches this particular is done for some other application. But as you see here, the, the active wheel rotates, but also the passive wheels on, on its collision or on uh, uh, interaction with the surface also rotates, uh, allowing it to move on uh, sidewards, for example, and creating motions which would not be possible with other kind of drives. So the next kind of vehicles that we see are what are called as tracked vehicles. In this case, these are almost similar to the skid steer vehicle that we saw, but there's a track around the platform. And these are really interesting for, uh, for environments which, in which wheels won't do. So you really need to have these kind of tracks in order, for example, to go up and down rugged surfaces or stairs in this case. As you can imagine, this is quite a rough kind of drive. So there is no mechanism per se to, to steer these tracks so that you can have a smooth motion. You, whenever you turn, they're not the nicest experience, but basically essentially you skid in order to uh, turn similar to the skid steer mechanism. So what we see here is another kind of robots or a kind of motion, in this case, a humanoid motion. So uh, we have legged systems. So the, the, the movement or the locomotion for a humanoid system is much more complicated as it first has to figure out, in this case, where those uh, steps are and then make the movement. So in this case, the robot does what is called as a static, statically stable uh, movement. So it moves such that at every point in its movement, it's stable. So we as humans, typically don't walk like this. We walk in a dynamic way such that we are, may always be falling. So we're not stable at each point of time, but while tracking or while movement, we are stable overall. Right, so this is another kind of movement, which is not a wheeled based movement, but using legged systems. So the main advantage of such systems is that if we want a robot to operate in environments, which are already, so to say, made for humans, you don't want to redesign them for wheeled uh, vehicles. This is the kind of systems that one needs to uh, develop. So something that's more cool, so to say, to look at is this robot called as the uh, Atlas system that's developed by Boston Dynamics. So in this case, what you see here is a dynamic kind of stability. So it's not stable at any one point in time, but overall while making the movements, it's uh, stable. So uh, this is a very complex system with several controllers ensuring that uh, these different motions are being uh, followed. And so it's one of the very few robots which have these capabilities to, uh, to do it. So they are able to do really complex movements. This is of course helped by, helped by the specific hardware that they have, but also understanding the dynamics or understanding the movement in order to do such uh, complicated uh, tasks in the environment, so to say. Okay. With that, we uh, move to a couple of terms that we often come across when we are uh, studying or reading papers about uh, motion of different platforms. And one of these terms is what is called as the non-holonomic constraints. So essentially non-holonomic constraints are those which limit the possibilities for a particular platform, how it moves in the configuration space or how it moves or to where it can move. Uh, for example, uh, if you think of a differential or a synchronous drive, uh, they can move on a circular trajectory. So they can move on any circular trajectory, including one with a radius of zero, but they cannot move sideways. So this is a kind of a holonomic constraint that exists for our differential robot. 
However, if we think of the same case, when we have a robot which is equipped with mechanum wheels, so the wheels which lets us move sideways as well, it has no uh, holonomic constraints. So there is no place or the, there is no pose, so to say, in the configuration space where we cannot reach. And so we can always reach any particular pose in the configuration space, starting from wherever we are, if we have no non-holonomic constraints. The other term that, uh, that, that exists there is what are called as holonomic constraints. These differ from the non-holonomic constraints in the sense that holonomic constraints are those constraints which actually restrict the configuration space or the valid configuration space that the platform can assume in the first case. So uh, they, they sound similar, but it's slightly different, the two constraints. So in the non-holonomic constraints, it's that the control space with respect to the current uh, configuration itself is uh, reduced in the sense that, for example, for a differential robot, moving sideways is not possible due to the lack of, so to say, the controls or on that particular platform. But whereas holonomic constraints mean those constraints or those parts of the configuration, configuration space that are not reachable at all irrespective of our controls itself. So for example, if you think of a system which moves on a track, so a train on a track, or certain uh, trailer systems where you can attach, say, to your car, a particular trailer in the back. And since it's attached with, say, a link, there are certain poses or certain configuration spaces which cannot be reached at all. And such uh, constraints are called as holonomic constraints. These are important to know because uh, if we have certain holonomic constraints or non-holonomic constraints, this information is useful, for example, during planning. So if you want to move around in a, in a room with, let's say, several obstacles, if there are certain things our platform cannot do, then such knowledge would be useful to have uh, before planning. Of course, if we have a platform which has no holonomic constraints or no non-holonomic constraints, that's the best case. This means that the planning problem itself becomes much easier as our platform can essentially do anything that uh, that our planning algorithm requires us to do given that it's a free space. Okay, with that we move to the, uh, the next topic which is what is called as dead reckoning uh, or odom and odometry. So dead re reckoning essentially means we want to estimate the motion uh, based on the, on the inputs that have been given to the platform. So for example, if we have a differential robot, and we give a certain velocity to the left and the right uh, uh, wheel. And we want to estimate how far this particular robot has moved. Of course, in the ideal case, if the robot does exactly what we asked it to do, then this dead reckoning would be the perfect position of where the robot is. But typically, this is not the case. This, there could be some limits in control. The surface might not be smooth. There's all kinds of conditions which uh, which result in the fact that if you just uh, estimate where you will be based on the commands that you would give, you would not have the most accurate estimate. So to compute the estimates just using the controls or the inputs is what is called as dead reckoning. So you integrate these commands over time to figure out where you move. So for example, if I say I move with a velocity of one meter per second for three seconds, I would move a distance of three meters. And this would be a dead reckoning solution for where you are. Whereas odometry is basically a little bit more, which uh, means that you actually have some kind of encoders on your wheel. So these count, for example, the number of revolutions that your wheels make, and you use these revolutions to figure out how much you move. So since this is kind of a feedback uh, on the movement that you make, so say you ask the wheels to rotate at a certain a certain velocity. Uh, maybe the wheels didn't rotate at that certain velocity. However, since you recorded how many revolutions the wheels actually did, typically odometry measures end up being more accurate than, uh, than a dead reckoning kind of estimate. So here's a simple example to see how this uh, odometry looks like. So in this case, what we see here is kind of a maze environment in which a robot is moving. So this is how the robot actually moved. However, due to some errors in the odometry, so there's some kind of a systematic error, it seems here towards the right. This is what we expect, or this is what we estimate our robot to have done 
In this case, there's a systematic error to the right and therefore at each, uh, each term, we have this drift that accumulates over time. However, given the odometry sensors that we have, this is what we got. So this is probably a quite a noisy sensor, therefore there's a large error. Of course, depending on the quality of the odometry sensor or the, of the encoders, we might have better or worse uh, estimates. Either way, dead reckoning and odometry are a way to estimate the, uh, the motion. So what is the movement that the robot has done in the environment? And we'll be seeing this further in further lectures. We'll use this odometry, so to say, as a prediction step where we have an initial guess of uh, where our robot is and then fuse these with extra information coming from the sensors to figure out uh, a, a better post for the robot itself. So as a summary, what I introduced today was different kinds of wheeled drives. So we saw a differential uh, robot, an Ackerman robot, and a couple of other more sophisticated wheeled uh, uh, motions. We saw the math to describe the motion for the differential drive, and we also saw some equations for the Ackerman drive in order to move it along a trajectory smoothly. Then we saw the idea, or we at least introduce the terms of non-holonomic and holonomic constraints, uh, which basically limit the movements that a robot is able to do in an environment and why such constraints are important to consider for other tasks such as planning. And we shortly saw what the terms odometry and dead reckoning means and how they let us estimate what movement that they, what is the movement that the robots have done. With that, I thank you for your attention.